And there's a very good study done in, in Australia a few years ago by a guy um, called Graham Turner. And uh, there have been several other studies that show that we're trending exactly as these lines were there. Now, I would argue that this process of collapse is already underway. Mm -hmm. That things like climate change and species loss, and, and, and I'll talk more in a few minutes about things like migration, and political crises, these are all signs of the system coming apart. And that's because we live in overshoot. So the, the, the capacity of the planet, the planet has a certain capacity for life. And around the mid-1980s, we passed through that limit. And so today, we live as if we have 1.6 planets. Now, in, it varies around the world. In the, in, in the US, and I imagine in Canada too, you live as if you have five planet Earths. You're using resources at five times the sustainable rate. In, in Switzerland, it's four times. In Europe, it's mostly nearer three, most of Europe. But actually, when we think about countries that are, that are growing, like Asia or Africa, they actually live below the limit. The problem is in the rich world. The rich world is consuming resources at too great a rate. Now, that's the trend line. This is what limits to growth says is going to happen, which is that nature will, come, it will force us back into balance. You can't live beyond the capacity of nature for an extended period. Nature will correct. And this is what the Club of Rome is about. How do we bring things back into balance? How do we <coughs> find a way to shift the system back into some sort of harmony? And of course, we're chasing a moving target because we're destroying so much of the planet that the, the baseline is declining. So that's what we're trying to do. Now, because we're in overshoot, the most serious consequence and really the only one that matters, is climate change. And I just want to talk a little bit about, about what's happening, because I, I, I was at a symposium in Rome two and a half weeks ago, climate change symposium, uh, a lot of very interesting people there. We went to the European Space Centre and saw some of the latest satellite data of what's going on. We have this problem because of the growth in greenhouse gas emissions. This is, this is the last 800,000 years. This is the concentration of, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And I could also show you exactly the same chart for methane. This is the temperature. And you can see a one-to-one -one correlation. A very high rate of correlation between CO2, methane, and temperature of the planet. I'll show you longer-term history in a minute. And you can see what's happening here. Now, this, this chart was made uh, a few years ago. And it shows that we're at 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. I'll talk about what's actually happening today. But, but, but you can see there's been this dramatic drop in just the last 150 years in terms of the amount of CO2 and methane in the atmosphere. And that's what's causing the rise in temperature. And that's built into the system. There's a huge lag in the system of maybe t several decades between what we do now and what is going to play out in the future which is one of the big problems. If you're trying to stop this problem, if you're trying to address it, for a politician to turn around and say, let's stop burning coal, oil, and gas today, the situation will continue to get worse. Now, that's a difficult political sell. This is what's happening to the polar ice cap. This is the, the Arctic ice cap. This gray area, if you can see it, is the, is the, is the median of the extent of, of ice in the, in the early part of the year between 1980 and 2010. This dotted red line, dotted line here, was 2012, which was the worst year that we had on record. This blue line is where we are this year. That's up until a few weeks ago. So we're way off, even 2012, in terms of the amount of sea loss. And if you look over the whole year, what happens is that the, the, the ice melts and it freezes again in the winter. And so it has this pattern over the year. There's, there's 2012, and here's, here's where we are today. So we're, we're, we're trending worse than the worst year now. This is what's happening in Siberia. This only started 18 months ago. But one of the big risks is that, that as the permafrost melts, there's, there's lots and lots of trapped methane underneath the permafrost. And when that comes up, if that's released, then the entire process will, will, be, will accelerate because methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than, than CO2. 
But what's happening is, and this is maybe fortuitous, is that it's exploding. And so it's being released as carbon dioxide rather than as methane. But, but the, there's, there's 7,000 of these, these, and this is, this is a piece of the ground, rising up because of the, the pressure of the gas underneath. There's a picture of what it's like in the winter. And that's, that's th th these are the, the bubbles that have been left and are now filled with water of the methane exploding. So we're having some pretty big impacts with what we're doing already. We have about four years left to avoid reaching one and a half degrees. Now, that's, that's the, the limit that Paris said that they want to try and get to. Now, the amount of carbon dioxide that we're releasing from man-made activities has actually been steady for the last three years. But the mud of methane has been going up. So the situation today is still getting worse. Now, if we carry on increasing the rate as we're doing, then we will reach a point in terms of the parts per million that will make one and a half degrees inevitable. It won't happen in four years, but it will happen with about 10 to 15 years after that. And we'll reach one and a half degrees. Now, one and a half degrees hits the point at which all the coral reef will die. So it's one of the, it's one of the, 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 the pressure points. One of the points that, that, that shows that we're having a really big impact. And already, I mean, you can see the effect on the um, Great Barrier Reef where half of it, more than half of it, is now in crisis. The problem is not just uh, in terms of the environment. It's also a social problem. This has been what's happening in, in Europe. And there has been a huge drought in Syria. It was a seven or eight year long drought in Syria, which caused a lot of people to leave the land. And they moved into the cities, and that created a lot of conflict, particularly between different groups, and was the beginning of the entire Syrian crisis. The Syrian crisis is greatly driven by climate change. And you can see the same thing happening in parts of North Africa today. People are migrating away from places that they can't grow crops any longer and where the water is, is, is evaporating. And you can see the same thing happening in places in South America. So climate change is with us already, and it's having a pretty big impact. And that's behind a lot of the migration. It's also an issue in Asia. Bangladesh is kind of ground zero for climate change because it's so low-lying. And what's happening is that the, the, the seawater is, is rising. A lot of people who used to be farming uh, rice are now putting their houses up on stilts and farming prawns instead. But as the seawater continues to rise, 30 million people will be displaced. What's India doing? It's built a two-meter-high fence all the way around the border of Bangladesh to keep the Bangladeshis in with 80,000 troops patrolling. So this whole thing about, you know, this is a problem for the future, this is a problem today. And we need to start thinking about it in those terms. This is a, a map which was put together by the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the US, and it shows kind of hot and cold areas and dry areas around. It's probably very difficult to see. You can see this dry areas in, in north of uh, South America here, <laughs> around the north coast. I'll just show you what they're predicting for 2030 to 2039. That's what's going to happen. You're going to have huge areas, northern Spain, northern Africa, Turkey, um, Greece, I think, becoming very difficult places to live within 20 years. I was One of the things that we discovered in this meeting in Rome a few weeks ago is the European Research, the European Space Centre is in the town of Frascati, which is where the wine comes from. And up until a few years ago, uh, it was very difficult to get the alcohol content of Frascati above 10, 10%. Now they can't keep it below 14. <laughs> now that's a good consequence of climate change perhaps for a while, but it also means that in 20 or 30 years, it'll be very difficult to grow grapes there at all. So again, it's having a very clear impact. And we had a, a lecture about what's happening in the whole Mediterranean area. And, and it's changing there really very fast in terms of water availability and, and crop yield. Now, one of the other things that's very interesting to note about this is that Northern Europe and where you guys are, it's going to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now, your, your crop yields will go up. Your summers will become more pleasant. The winters will become less cold. And the same in Russia and parts of Northern Europe. But it means that a lot of the people who make the decisions, 
the next 50 years is going to get better. And the people who are going to suffer in places like India and, and southern Southeast Asia and Latin America are the poor. So it's all very well to say you're going to be okay here, but a lot of people here are going to want to come here. They're going to want to come to places where they're going to be safe. So we're talking some big issues here. Without change, if we don't stop what we're doing, the two degrees that the scientists say is dangerous will get there in about 15 to 20 years. This is from Jurgen's book, 2052, and it shows the CO2 in the atmosphere here. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, it was 290 parts per million. <coughs> and it's generally accepted that when we reach 450 parts per million, that's the two degrees. Now, when I started using this chart about 18 months ago, it was 402. Now, 23rd of April, a few weeks ago, I looked it up, it was 410. Now, it goes up and down, so it's 406 today. But, but if you take a, a three to four part per million increase each year, which is what's happening, it doesn't do, it's not terribly difficult arithmetic to work out that we've got about 15 years left before we hit a point which is 450 parts per million. Now that doesn't mean we're going to hit two degrees because of the lag in the system. We probably won't hit two degrees until maybe 2050. But at that point, we cannot stop it. So the situation is really very urgent and we have to make some very big changes. Two degrees is a lot. When you think about the temperature of the planet, and you you know you look at the weather out here today, and it was you know what Sheila said it was like twenty nine last week, and it was thirteen when I arrived. Two degrees seems like you know, that's no problem. You need to think about the temperature of the planet the way you think about the temperature of your body. Your body is a finely tuned biological mechanism, which operates at thirty seven degrees. At thirty eight, that's classified as a fever. And at 39, your life's at risk. The planet's the same. Does anyone want to guess what the average temperature of the planet is? 14. 14 yeah. it's, it was 14 and a half before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Today it's 15 and a half. This shows 65 million years of climatic history. You can see the last half a million years here. Let's zoom in on that part. So that, there's, there's the last half a million years of, of climatic history. There's the last ice age down here. And that's what's happened. So actually, the, the, the average for the last half a million years, we're already quite high above that. We're, we're living in a warm period. Now, we're one, one degree above that today. And one of the ironies, one of the big problems is that when we stop burning CO2, it'll immediately jump half a degree. Because, because coal actually acts as a coolant in the atmosphere. It has an aerosol effect. And so as soon as we stop burning coal, it'll jump up, ironically. But if we go back two degrees, that red line, it actually takes us back more than 10 million years in climatic history. This is no small change. This is a, a, a major change in, in, in the planet. And we, we would eventually lose all the Greenland ice shelf and the West Antarctic ice shelf. Now, that's not going to happen in our lifetime or even our grandchildren's lifetime because the quantity of ice will take too long to melt. The heat required is too great. But eventually that will happen. And that's the process that they're worried about. And if we go to four degrees, which is where we're heading today, all the ice on Earth will be lost and we'll be back more than 30 million years in history. So we're talking some very big changes here. And the economic cost is rising. This is a, a chart from Munich Reinsurance. And you can see different events here. So this little red line, if you can see it along the bottom there, is, is geophysical events, so volcanic activity, earthquakes, over the period from 1980 to 2015. And they've stayed pretty constant. So that's a good test that you know that's not changing. This green line here is meteor meteorological events. So storms, they've doubled in the last 35 years. Hydrological events, which is floods and landslides, and climatological events, which are extremes of temperature and droughts and forest fires, they've gone up fourfold. And so the insurance sector is actually at the forefront of a lot of this. They understand the implications of a lot of this, this stuff much more than most other industrial uh, enterprises. Okay, how do we fix this? 
This is a chart from, from Paris, IPCC. This is all the different scenarios about what ha what's happening. Uh, this, is, this is where we're heading right now, which is towards uh, about four degrees by the end of the century. The only one that works is this blue block. Now, look how quickly we've got to reduce carbon output. We've got to reduce it dramatically. I'll show you some numbers in a second about how dramatically. But not only do we have to reduce the carbon output quickly, we also have to have, in the last 50 years of the century, negative emissions. We have to find a way of capturing the carbon in the atmosphere and sucking it out of the atmosphere and somehow storing it. Mm -hmm. Now, that technology doesn't exist yet. So even the best forecast from Paris is dependent on some sort of technology we don't know how to do if we're to stay below two degrees. And also, and this is important, the IPCC numbers for this scenario, they reckon there's a 66% chance of us meeting it. And so the question I ask myself is, you know, would you get on an aeroplane if it had a 66% chance of reaching its destination? <laughs> Without change, we're going to see a lot of instability. We're going to see more migration. People in India and Bangladesh and Southeast Asia are going to want to go somewhere a bit safer. We're going to see a lot of people coming out of Africa and Mexico, trying to move north and south. And a lot of the migration in Africa, by the way, that's coming into Europe, there's twice as many going south. We're going to see more sea defences. The Dutch are building lots of sea defences. I mean, the predictions are for a metre rise in sea levels by the end of the century, which will see places like New York and much of Florida and London and Shanghai uh, and Singapore all underwater. So a lot of money is going to be spent on concrete. Great business opportunity. Buildings are going to have to be reinforced in places that they're not used to extremes of temperature and humidity. <coughs> I used to live in Hong Kong. Buildings with that sort of level of humidity and heat don't last very long, whereas in Scotland, they're not built for that sort of temperature. More infectious diseases and poverty. So we're going to see more mosquitoes in places where you don't normally expect them. And I saw something in the paper this morning about ticks and Lyme's disease here. And that's a direct consequence. Water shortages, floods, food chain disruption. Civil disorder, political extremism, this is partly a backlash to what's happened, that people are fed up with the system not working. And then financial sector instability. So we're going to see an economic uh, roller coaster of that. Let's be clear, Paris is not going to fix it. Paris is, is, is a miracle in one way, in that they came to an agreement, and a disaster in another, because it's not nearly enough. This, this is where we're going. This is the Paris commitments, of which not many people have done much at all. And this is where we need to get. So Paris is a good step forward, and we can build on it, but it's not enough. And key is that the oil industry is still not on board. They don't get this at all. There's where we've got to go, and these are the scenarios put out by Shell, Exxon, and BP, as where they think carbon production is going to go in the next couple of decades. So these guys, you know, we need to take them to court and say, you know, <laughs> crimes against humanity factor. So, at the current forecast, we need to reduce the rate of carbon output by 10% a year to meet the target. Now that's unprecedented. And it's why it requires major political change. This is all perfectly possible. And when people say, you know, there's no solution, there is a solution. But the solution is not technological, the solution is political. It's about a social decision by us to move in the right direction. And, and, and it's not about inventing some new way of, of, of doing anything. We have all the technology we need. Climate change is not actually the problem. Climate change is a symptom of the real problem. The real problem is two causes. First of all, the human ecological footprint. The fact that there are too many people on the planet too quickly. I'll show you something about that in a minute. But this is what I was talking about earlier on. This is the ecological footprint per region of the world. So North America, five, Europe here, three, and here's Asia and Africa. We have in our heads the idea that the pollution is being caused by China. And that the overpopulation is being caused by China and India. It's all wrong. 
The pollution is being caused here and by us having our stuff now manufactured in China. And a child born here is 30 times more ecologically damaging than one born in Africa. So it's our children that are creating this problem, not African children. This is what's happened to the population. I mean, this is the, this is the, the last 10,000 years. You know, this is human population. <laughs> Suddenly, bang, straight up. When I was born in 1960, there were 3 billion people on Earth. In 2011, we hit 7 billion. Today, 7.6. Just six years later, we're increasing by 100 million a year. Now, if you think about that going forward, a lot of these people, most of the people in the world are still quite young. And they haven't hit their, their ecological footprint maximum yet. All that's in the pipeline. They're going to start using energy and resources in ways that they don't use them today, which is why there are lags in the system that have to be dealt with. So that's the problem, and it is not a happy one. And you can see here, this is the population, and this is CO2. You know, one-to-one -one correlation. So population is the elephant in the room that nobody ever wants to talk about. And it's true, we can't fix that problem quickly. But we need to start at least having a discussion about it and limit the rate of growth. The second reason we have this problem, apart from population, is the economic system. The economic system forces us to have growth. Every year, we have to increase the rate of GDP, we have to increase the rate of output. Now, to increase GDP means we have to use more resources. More resources every year. We have to dig up and process. And to turn them into goods requires energy. And because the cheapest form of energy today is carbon-based, we increase the amount of CO2 and other gases we produce, which creates climate change. So this desire for economic growth is the cause of climate change. Absolutely direct cause and consequence. But the economic system does lots of other things, which we need to kind of recalibrate our brains about. We think that economic growth reduces inequality. We think there's this trickle-down effect, that the rich get richer and they go and spend their money, and that creates jobs, and that allows the money to trickle down to the pockets of the poor. Complete nonsense. I'll show you some numbers in a minute. We think that it reduces poverty, that it flows from the rich world to the poor world, that we invest and we trade and the poor are somehow better off. It doesn't do that either, as I'll show you. And we ignore externality. The entire system has got us to think that we don't have to price in externality. So the value of, of the rainforest is apparently zero. The value of the fish in the sea is apparently only what we can get when we sell them. The value of the atmosphere is zero. The value of other species, zero. This economic thinking is plainly insane. And yet we've all begun to think that that's correct and normal. Just show you what's happening here. This is, you know, you, any politician, you'll say, you know, we need to create jobs. Let's have more economic growth. Rubbish. This is OECD, the Club of Rich Countries, 1990 to 2015. There's what happened to GDP. Some of the fastest growth in human history in the rich world in those 25 years. That's what happened to our employment. It went up. In a stable population. And the wave of robotization and mechanization that's coming is going to increase growth and in GDP, but it will also increase unemployment. If you want to have a policy to create jobs, have a policy to create jobs. Don't think that one thing will create jobs for you, because it doesn't. When economists talk about inequality, they use something called the Gini coefficient. Now, the Gini coefficient is between one, is it zero and one, or zero and a hundred. And at zero, it means everybody is completely equal. Everybody has exactly the same level of wealth. And at one or a hundred, one person in that society has all the wealth. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, I, I don't know what Canada is today, but most of Europe, I think Canada is actually very similar in that sense. It's, it's in the late 20s, in the upper 20s, early 30s. The US is 48, very high level of inequality. Uh, China, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, was 16. I've never seen anything lower than that. 
This is a chart from the OECD showing inequality between 1820 and 2000. The world inequality has gone up. So this entire industrial process, this entire economic development that we that we have, have supposedly had the benefit of for the last 200 years has increased inequality. And this is between the rich world and the poor world. <coughs> it went up from 16 to 54. So the gap between places like India and Africa and Canada is three times bigger today than it was in 1820. So this idea that that, that, that economic growth is going to lift every boat is complete rubbish. The rich get richer, and that's designed into the system. When I worked for The Economist, and you see this from, from, from the World Bank and, and, and the IMF, they often talk about it lifting a billion people out of poverty. It's a number that's quoted all over the place. It's not true. In 1980, there were 1.9 billion people living in a dollar a day down to 1.2 billion by 2010. So from 42% of the world population down to 18%. <coughs> Take out China, because it's a completely different economic system that they've pursued there, and for the rest of the world, there's still been a decrease in the amount of poverty in the world. But these numbers don't account for inflation. A dollar a day in 1980 was then increased to a dollar 25 and then a dollar 50, but actually a dollar a day then is $2.65 in 2010 which means that poverty has actually gone up. And today it's about $2.87. So more than half the world lives in poverty today. More than 90% of the people on the planet live on less than $10 a day. So the idea that this economic system, which is creating all this goodness, is nonsense. It increases inequality, it increases joblessness, it increases poverty, and it destroys the planet. The economic system is at the root of all these problems. Defining what we need is not hard. This is from Kate Rayworth's new book, uh, Donut Economics. Yes. Understanding the problem, defining the problem, is comparatively simple. Defining what we need is also comparatively simple. We need to live within the boundaries of nature, and we need to think about the long term, not the short term. Bait put very simply. The real difficulty is working out how to get there. That's what's foxed us all for the last 45 years. How do you move there without making it worse? Which is what the book's about. Why don't we do something? A number of you have sort of had this conversation with me. Why, why have we not done anything for the last 45 years? And I think we need to think about that a lot more. Because there's not enough academic work on this area. I think there's five basic reasons. First of all, politics. Our political systems are stuck in this outdated industrial society logic. They think that we have to have growth, that we have to have manufacturing, that we have to have jobs, and they define jobs in a very 19th century way. A lot of politicians are also very financially dependent on big business. And so they have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. So our conclusion is the politicians, not all of them, but a, a lot of the politicians are not going to make the changes that are necessary. So talking to them actually doesn't serve a huge amount of purpose. Secondly, there are the vested interests. There are the 1%. There are the people who are doing very nicely out of this, the, the fat cat bankers and the, the people who are running the big corporations and getting rich. They don't want the system to change because they're doing very nicely. And they're going to fight very hard to defend their, 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 their turf. Thirdly, Human nature is very short-termist, and it thinks about tomorrow much more than it thinks about next year. We're frightened of change. We're frightened of, 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 of anything we don't understand. And even if you come along and say, look, I can give you a better world with more fairness and a more, uh, better standard of living, people don't believe it. Most people are frightened of it. They'd rather have what they know than what they don't know. <coughs> Fourth time, when Limits to Growth was written in 1972, it was too early. Everybody was talking about landing on the moon and doing something exciting, new technology and developing and growth and everything that could be achieved. Now, the timing is much better now, but I'm still not sure that it's there yet for the change that's needed. And then finally, cost. Doing it right is going to cost more. If it didn't, we'd be doing it. So we have to accept that we're going to have to pay more. More for our energy and more for our goods if we're going to do it properly. And we're not willing to do that. It's a social Political decision. Okay, let me just come to a conclusion. Uh, 
This is some of the ideas in the book. Okay, so this is where we are beginning to think about the way forward. It needs to bring together a coalition of of organizations and people of the willing. The people that actually see what's happening and that want to push for change. People in the UN, a lot of people in the UN really do understand what's going on here. Some countries, I think immediately in places like Germany, Scandic countries, China, as I said earlier on, countries that see this much more clearly than others. And the Americans are not in there right now at all. Now, it may be good if we all run off together and do something, uh, a coalition of the willing, the Americans are waking up and want to come with us. But right now, they're not part of that group. Civil society, trades unions, a lot, of, a lot of them can see the benefits of a change in the economic system. So let's get them on board. The legal system can play a very important role here. They can help educate judges on, 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 on what environmental destruction actually means. Education system. That's where we're working on this, this Reclaim Economics. Help young people understand what's going on, and they want to be part of the change as well. Defense. The US Defense Network and the German Defense System have written some really profound works on climate change. They understand how serious this is. You know, let's get them on board. Religious groups. Uh, Sheila talked about the Church of England. We had a very good discussion with, with the Archbishop of Canterbury. We've had very good discussions with the Pope. Uh, uh, the see is that they really fundamentally get it. Let's bring them on board. We need to reach out to the Muslim world as well. You see a lot of people talking about the business solution and about, about, about businesses being green. That is possible. You can have a green business. You can do better trade. You can behave more reasonably. <coughs> business is only 5% of the answer. That They're driven by a process which requires them to increase profit in the short term, requires them to dump costs on future generations and the environment. That's the system. And I know a lot of people who work in business and in the finance sector who desperately want to do the right thing. I think about someone like Paul Coleman at Unilever who's trying to do the right thing. But the market won't let him. The finance sector won't let him. He has to perform, otherwise he gets canned and somebody else comes in to take his place. That's the system. So they may want to do a good job, but they can't because the system drives them in a different direction. So, so business is not part of the solution. I think I am going to stop there and we can take some discussion. There is a way forward, but it is very urgent and it is not through the normal political process. We have to be much cleverer than that. We have to bring together a coalition of the willing and help them understand about the need for change. That's the way forward if we're going to do this peacefully. Sorry to have disturbed your digestive system. <laughs> <laughs>